Welcome to Universal Man, where we turn your flight into fight so that you can master yourself and conquer your goals. My name is Mark Weppet, and I am here to help you sharpen your masculine edge so that you can cut through the resistance that's holding you back from living on the front lines of life and being a man that you admire. And today I'm back with another episode of the Sexual Self Mastery Series. It's been a little bit since uh, I put one of these up, but today's going to be a big one. Basically, I'm going to be talking about how to dramatically increase your willpower. And this is a little bit different than some of the other stuff that I've been working on because since the beginning of this series, the general assumption is that you have a very low amount of willpower and you need to be super uh, optimized in the way that you go about any kind of self-development sort of thing. Otherwise, you risk depleting your willpower. You know, it's like a, a resource that you can't fully rely on. Well, in a sense, that's still true. But what if you could make it way more? reliable. Well, that's what I'm going to be covering today. Most guys struggle to quit porn because they aren't building the right habits to replace porn. If you want to learn the simple habit replacement system I've used to help thousands of men quit porn and develop self-mastery, then click the link in the description below and download my free Reboot Regimen guide. Okay, so I'm really excited for this video. I think that for many of you out there, especially if you have really followed a lot of my other stuff and you're still not quite getting the results that you're looking for, uh, I think that this could be a, kind of a missing link for you. Um, I know that it actually has been with many of the people that I've shared it with. And so it's kind of different from my other stuff and it can be a little bit more difficult to teach, but I think I've got a handle on how to do that now. Um, but along with that, this is going to be a bit of a longer video. And in part, it's because I don't really like, at least so far, I don't like breaking these concepts up too much and introducing them separately. Because I think it's very important to see how the whole thing works together in order to get a good idea of the value of the approach that I'm about to show you. Now, since I am going to be sharing a lot of different kind of stuff, you know, if you find it useful and you really want to take this seriously, take breaks throughout this, you know, stop, take some notes, you know, don't try and absorb it necessarily all at once because, uh, depending upon where you're starting from, that can be a little bit too much. Or, you know, you could just watch part of the video and then try out the stuff I'm talking about and then come back to it later. Okay, and final note before we get started is that this is going to be more of an introduction uh, to these concepts. It's not going to be a detailed program. Uh, if you want that, well, that's what's going to be coming out in my new course, which I will actually be having an announcement about very soon. And this will probably be the last uh, video that I put out on YouTube before the uh, the new course is out. Maybe I'll do like another kind of announcement thing, but uh, for the most part, I'm going to be going 100% into production here soon. So I'm really excited for that. And any of you guys who have been waiting for the new course, uh, you know, it's coming. So with all of that out of the way, let's get into it. All right. So the way we got to start this off, I, the way I want to frame this discussion is to break things down into kind of three layers of work. All right. In terms of sexual self-mastery or quitting porn or whatever, I would say that there's three primary layers of work. And you kind of want to, at least what I found in coaching people, is that you want to start on the top layer and then go deeper and deeper as is necessary if you're looking for the kind of the most efficient approach. All right. So the top layer of work, this is what I would call the practical layer. All right. And on the practical layer, you're pretty much talking about just habit changes. Right. You're talking about um, don't do this do this instead. And this is designed to help someone optimize their willpower usage pretty much. It's kind of like, you know, if you get triggered, don't just do nothing because that just has you and your willpower like just trying to hold back this urge. Instead, do something else. Try and, you know, go for a walk, you know, join uh look up a, you know, a recovery forum or something like that. Populate your brain with good information. That makes it so it's not so taxing to try and hold it back because most people, when they start down any kind of path of self-development, they just try to push. They just try to use pure willpower. And so I'm trying to get people away from that. And first layer is just developing those general lifestyle shifts that will help you with that. And that's a lot of what I cover in like my Reboot Regimen Guide, for example. Now, the first layer alone is often not enough because how do you get yourself to do those things? that you just talked about in the practical layer. Well, that's where the kind of rational layer comes in, the self-talk layer. Um, I mean, what I call it is the terminal layer. Like if any of you have seen my primal and terminal mind video, it's kind of like that part of your brain. You need to learn how to speak to yourself 
rationally in the moment. And th this self-talk is super, super important because if you can remind yourself why you're doing something and you can overcome the rationalizations against, you know, um, not doing it, well, that's going to allow you to act really well. And if you can clean up your self-talk around quitting porn, well, uh, that's going to do wonderful things for you. If you can remind yourself about how it's actually not going to just feel good, it's going to be a net loss in pleasure. Uh, if you can remind yourself that you actually don't want this thing, that uh, it's bad for you in X, Y, and Z way, and you can speak those things into yourself, that's going to allow you to quit, right? And part of that is getting to know all that you know other stuff you say, all those other lies, all those self-deceptions, all those rationalizations, and you got to learn how to dismantle them. So... That's the second layer of work in this area. But even that sometimes is not enough because, you know, I've been seeing this for a long time. It's like, okay, you guys got to do the self-talk. Well, I just didn't. I was just like overwhelmed. Like the emotion seemed too strong. I tried the self-talk, but it just, I, it just didn't click. And this is when I realized that, okay, there, we got to take this a layer deeper. And this is where we're getting into what I would call the energetic layer. Because if your emotions and uh, awareness and stuff get too poorly configured, <laughs> to put it uh, simply, you're not going to be able to think well. And if you're not going to be able to think well and speak your, and feed, good, feed yourself good thoughts, then you're not going to be able to act well either. And so what you need to have at the very baseline is you need to have control over your internal energy over your awareness and over, uh, you know, the emotions that course through your mind. You need to be able to put them in the right spots so that you can think clearly and you can act well. And this is the thing that I want to be talking about in this video. And it's a, uh, it's kind of a tricky thing to talk about uh, because <laughs> like the, the practical changes and the self-talk stuff that's kind of pretty simple to explain. It's like, hey, do this, don't do this. Um, you know, think this, don't think this. But once you get into the energetic layer, it's kind of like going from studying the science of a bicycle and the physics of how it works to getting into the actual, well, you got to go out and build the coordination. It's like, how do you tell someone how, they, how to balance on a bicycle? It's only, you can, words can only get you so far, right? Until the person actually has to get on there and try and figure it out inside their own nervous system. And energy works a very similar thing. So I'm going to be doing my best to try and give you the words and give you the mental pathways so that you can connect to these parts of yourselves uh, so that you can really start making some dramatic increases in what you can get done with your willpower. And before we go any further, I guess it's probably useful to actually define willpower here, uh, the way that we're using it, the way that I'm using it, is that willpower is the capacity to override part, another part of your brain. Plain and simple. It's like, if you want to do something and it's real easy for you to do it, you're probably not using any willpower. But if part of you is pushing back, it's giving you some resistance saying, hey, let's not do this, or hey, I don't want to do this, this is uncomfortable, and you still go, well, that's when you're using willpower, is when you're pushing against some kind of resistance or some kind of discomfort. And we wanna really increase your capacity to do that. All right, so I think the first thing that we gotta understand about willpower is that uh, it operates on a range of intensity. So at the lower end is what I would call more static willpower, okay? And then at the upper range, it would be more dynamic willpower. So static willpower, that's great for maintaining a state of homeostasis, okay? So for example, like I'm standing right now and the muscles like in my back and in my legs and stuff, they are contracted, but only so much so that they keep me in a static position. I've, I've got, a, I'm in a state of sort of homeostasis in this standing and my willpower is, is kind of keeping me standing here. You know, if I completely let go, I would just collapse to the floor. But there's at least this sort of passive static will that is keeping me standing. And it, I can stand for a long time. It's not super draining. I mean, eventually it'll drain me and eventually I'll, you know, fall over if I stand for, you know, hours and hours and hours. But um, for right now, it's pretty sustainable. So we got to learn how to use a low level, but steady sort of will. But then, at the upper range, we got this more dynamic will. And this is when you're really flexing and, and tensing, all right? Like when you're deadlifting or something like that. That's when you're turning your will up. And th this kind of dynamic will 
is designed to move you out of a state of homeostasis. It's designed to create a new homeostasis. So like when you have to really flex something, that's when you're using dynamic will. And, you know, when I was talking about those layers, uh, the practical, the rational, and then the, you know, energetic, for lack of better terms, your willpower is connected to all of those. So on the practical level, we're primarily fo focused on this kind of muscular sort of will, like get yourself to do the action, contract your muscles so that you get up and get out and do that thing. Okay. On the mental layer, different kind of will. We're, we're talking more about those thinking muscles, all right? And the static and dynamic sort of hold here. So it's like you'll use a more static will to keep a thought in your head. Like, you know, I am quitting porn, I'm staying clean, or, you know, I'm focusing on this fulfilling discipline. That's something once it's there, you just use a static will to try to maintain it. But when you're doing more difficult stuff, like you're analyzing emotion or uh, and trying to come up with an answer to a rationalization or something, that can be uncomfortable work. It can be difficult cognitively. And you got to push yourself there. You got to flex it. And you might have to do it, especially if you're triggered or you want to do something else. You got to really push that thought into your head. And it's that same sort of feeling that you get, like if you're doing a complex math problem. So your willpower applies to that level as well. But then, you know, what we're trying to get down to is into the emotional layer. And this is where things I think are, are least understood. How do we use our willpower when working with more raw emotion? The thing is, almost everybody has at least a baseline sort of understanding of this, whether they're conscious of it or not. Like this is something that we all learn when we're growing up. And so it's like, you know, you learn how to deal with certain kinds of emotions that aren't useful or are incorrect. So for example, if you are a kid, eventually you learn how even if you really want to hit that other person, you don't hit them, okay? And this kind of thing, that's emotional energetic control. That kid's not rationally walking through this, that, and the other. They learn how to just suppress that urge, learn how to put it in a certain kind of place. Um, you know, if you had good parents who, you know, when you were throwing a temper tantrum, they put you in a corner and they said, all right, you can come out when you get yourself under control. Well, you ever see a kid doing that? They're like, actually, they might actually be like straining, trying to get themselves under control. And that's them doing energy work. Problem here is that most of us don't really develop this kind of energetic self-control beyond that sort of initial point. We need to become more sophisticated in our control of that. Like many of us, like, you know, our rational learning doesn't stop there. Our ability to do things doesn't stop there. But energetically, many of us, I think, are still kind of at grade school level at best. So my goal here is to at least open the door to allow you to start becoming as sophisticated in your energy management as you are in your rationality and your capabilities out in the world. So how are we going to do that? Well, the way that I understand it is that the best thing that you can do is use your willpower to learn how to manipulate two core energetic systems. And I would call it your negative system and your affirmative system. So you need to learn how to negate and flex that part of your neurology. And then you also need to learn how to affirm. And that also has its own set of kind of neural machinery. And you need to learn how to be proficient in the operating of both of these. And most of us have never consciously touched any of this kind of stuff. But once you start working with it, you're going to realize, holy crap, this is pretty powerful. When you become adept at operating these two kinds of systems, you become incredibly empowered in your ability to have your willpower manifest in good thought and good action. And that's the main goal here. So we're going to start with the negation energy. And there's a reason for this, because the seat of your freedom, the seat of your free will is based upon your capacity to say no. If you're in a situation where you cannot say no, well, then you are not free. You do not have the ability to operate free will at that moment. And I think in part, this is why little kids at certain stages in their development, they get really hooked on saying no. It's like you ever meet like a toddler who just says no, 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 no to every single question, even if it's something that they want. It's like, hey, do you want a cookie? No. <laughs> it's just because what they're doing is 
when they develop that capacity to say no, it makes them feel powerful because then that will open the door to them to ultimately say yes. But before you can say yes, you have to learn how to say no. And then later, I think I would say probably like in our teenage years, there's another sort of rebellion stage where people tune into their no and they're they're trying to feel powerful as a teenager. And that like, you know, maybe they're trying to break away more culturally or socially from their parents. And oftentimes they end up kind of going back to what their parents agreed with and or taught them anyway. But they need to come back on their own free will. And in order to do that, they have to say no first. So no really is the seat of the will. And you need to learn how to use negative energy properly. However, I would say most people really lack control over their negative faculties. So for example, if you're easily triggered by things, you know, sexual images, uh, any woman who walks by, if they can just reach in and twist up your energy and make you crave and think fantasy thoughts that aren't, you know, aligned with who you want to be, well, then you're lacking negation energy. You lack the capacity to energetically seal yourself off. You know, negation in many ways is kind of like, you know, a defense mechanism. It keeps anyone from just being able to come up and manipulate you. So if you're too open, well, that's not good. Like if you're too energetically open too always yes, well, this makes you a victim to the people around you. So if you're someone who when, you know, say someone walks into the room and they're in a bad mood, okay, if you all of a sudden start getting into a bad mood, well, you're lacking negation energy. <laughs> you're too open. You're absorbing all their crap they're throwing at you. If you just don't know how to respond to unhelpful, you know, cancerous sort of thoughts that come up like, oh, you suck or, oh, you screwed this up or, you know, kind of anxieties focusing on things that don't have any particular relevance or usefulness, but they kind of can destroy your day. Again, you're lacking negation energy. So how do we rectify the situation? Well, the first step is that you got to actually connect to your negative faculty here, okay? And yeah, you can say no with your mouth, no, but can you say it with your heart? <laughs> that might sound weird, but that's where things uh, on the energetic layer go. It's like, do you know how to say it inside your own body? Are you, allowed, are you able to connect with this? And some people, if you've done a lot of inner work, you might know what that actually means means and what that feels like. But if not, luckily, our nervous system is all connected. And there are certain sort of cues that, that can help you connect to it. So one is just the verbal cue of like, you know, practice saying no, but try and s connect that sensation, that thought of no with a sensation in your energetic sort of center here about, you know, right in kind of the center of your heart. Can you feel what that means to hold a no in your heart? Okay, if not, there's other things you can try. Um, you can try and flex your body real tense and say, no, <laughs> give that a shot because tension is how we connect to negative energy in the most part. It's because like that's what's used for attacking, for running, for, you know, doing all these kinds of visceral negative sort of activities are almost always tied to some kind of tension. OK, so if yes is relaxing and sort of opening up, well, then tension or, and would be more on the no side of pushing away, flexing and that sort of thing. Beyond just tense muscles, another thing that you can use to tap into the more intense sort of no is a kind of sharp exhale or even held breath. Because sharp exhales and held breath, those are neurologically tied to more negative sort of activity. So like the sharp breath, like... <laughs> That's what you, that's like a key op. Like that's what you, in, in martial arts, it's that noise they make when they're doing a strike or like, you know, you, you watch a boxer, they're always like, it's because when you do a sharp exhale, that stabilizes the body and allows you to produce force. And if you're doing kind of like a more slow grinding sort of motion, like a power lift, well, you don't exhale at all. You actually fully hold your breath. So you can do these kinds of things. Don't like, you know, pop any blood vessels or anything, but this is kind of stuff that will allow you to tap in to your hotter negative energy. So most people will be able to access it like that. So if you can think of, um, you know, a triggering thought, for example, you bring one up, you feel yourself getting triggered, flex your whole body and say no, and try and feel that inside of yourself. What does it mean to connect with that specifically in this sort of heart center? And as you get better at this, you don't need to flex your whole body. You can if that, if that makes it easier for you, but ultimately we want to get a much more fine level of control. 
So remember back when we were talking about how willpower can be in this dynamic flexed state and then this more static sort of softer state? Well, we need to learn how to do that with our no as well. So we've kind of already talked about this dynamic negation. This is when you're at that full flex mode. Okay. And this is very useful when you are in a state where you're being consumed by some kind of emotion. So for example, if you're getting really triggered, you're, you know, you, you're just feeling those sexual cravings, just mount and kind of start controlling your mind and you're just kind of caught inside their web. Maybe you're trying to talk to yourself, but it's just, oh, it just feels so good. Yeah. It wouldn't be so bad if I just looked up some porn or whatever. This is when you got to ah, freak out and press that no button up to 10. Okay. And when you do this, this is actually going to create a little bit of space. You're going to feel a difference It's you're going to be able to go from that sensation of feeling like you're inside and consumed by the urge to having the urge kind of next to you looking at it. And until you actually do this yourself, this might sound kind of weird, but that's, that's what you need to do is you need to f use a dynamic negation to create space, get whatever that emotion is, off of your control center. It's kind of like if you get swallowed by the dragon, well, you better, you know, turn on the afterburners and try and cut your way out of its belly. Otherwise, you're about to get digested and it's not <laughs> it's not going to be good for you, right? So, this is kind of like that do or die sort of intensity. Now, we can't stay there. You can't rely 100% on this energy. You need to know when to pull it out, when things are hard. And there's, you know, differing degrees. There's a difference between, you know, turning it up to 11 and, you know, banging out a solid eight. Okay. Like this, there's degrees here, but generally the higher you go, you're in this dynamic sort of state and it's more powerful, but less sustainable. So you use that when you need to create a sharp shift, you spike your energy up, right? But in order to maintain a shift in the face of resistance, this is where you need to learn how to hold your no in a more static state. So it's like this actually tends to be a little bit harder for people, but I mean, it's still relatively simple. It's like, can you, can you connect to that flexed no and then try and relax into it while still holding the no? It, it's the difference between, you know, a full on assault with machine guns blaring to putting up a concrete wall. Okay. That's, that's the, the static. No, it's more like a wall. It's like a ceiling sort of activity. And you need to be able to feel both of these. And the pattern when you're triggered is usually a strong flex, throw it out of the control room, and then you got to shut the door. So the throwing out of the control room, that's the strong flex and the shutting the door. That's the more static kind of press against it. And this is really powerful because you can always check yourself. It's just something you can literally check inside of your, your body. It's like, you know, how, how, how strong is your commitment to quitting porn right now? Well, you check that wall of negation, that part of you that's saying no to porn. Does it feel like there's any cracks in it? As you get good at this stuff, you're actually going to be able to feel this. You're going to be like, ah, hmm, no, I'm, I'm actually feeling a little weak here. I need to reinforce this part of my wall. And it's kind of weird to talk about that, but it works <laughs> and you can feel it and it gives you a lot of confidence and self-awareness. So when you can wield your negation powers properly, it's going to allow you to create space in scenarios where you didn't have it. So in the past where, you know, you, tr you couldn't engage in self-talk because you're just so consumed by the emotion. Well, you're going to be able to do that because you're going to be able to throw that feeling off, throw that emotion off, and you're going to be able to kind of construct a at least a wall up against it. And it's going to take a little while to learn how to do this specifically with emotions, but everyone kind of knows how to do it. I mean, if you know how to repress <laughs> a thought, well, it's kind of like that, but a little different. So let's talk for a second about repression because most people, well, I don't know if most people, but some people I think would be worried that when I'm talking about negation here, I'm talking about repression and there is a difference. All right. Repression is an act of fear. It's a, it's an act of trying to create a shortcut. It's like, if I don't look at this thing, if I just pretend it's not there, just stuff it down, then it'll go away. And that's not what we're doing here. Okay. With repression, you're trying to completely push something out of your consciousness and make it completely disappear and say, I'm not going to deal with that. With negation, yes, you're pushing it off the controls. And yes, you might be putting it behind a wall. But just because it's behind a wall doesn't mean it's out of your awareness. In fact, it's actually probably useful to keep that thing kind of in the corner of your awareness so that you can keep an eye on it. 
Like my whole theory is that the reason why when you repress, eventually you act out is because you've lost a neurological control over that part of yourself. Like imagine if you ignored your arm, like if you just re repressed your arm, it started to do shit on its own. You know, it's like, oh, if you're not going to control me, I'm going to control myself. <laughs> and I think that's kind of what emotions do is that if you do not consciously control them, they will just kind of take the path of least resistance. And since you've cut off your connection to it, well, you can't control it. And this is where those sort of autopilot relapses, I think, come from. So by learning how to take those negative, those unhelpful emotions off your control panel, and then keep them away from it, but not repress them, keep them conscious, this actually, I think, gives you much more control. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of negation. Um, play around with that inside yourself, uh, and you're going to be able to find those energies. Now, the next step, though, is we got to get into affirmation, and this is very important. It's kind of like we got the yin and the yang. You know, I would say the, the, the negation would be the yang, and the affirmation would be the yin. And the, the th reason why we need this is because you can't just fight against. That's kind of like what neg negation is. It's like this fighter sort of energy. Archetypally, that's what it would be. It would be the fighter, okay? But you can't just fight against. You have to fight for if you want to be really sustainable in your capacity for self-control. And this is the affirmative energy. The affirmative energy is the lover, all right? It's the, the part of you that connects with what you're fighting for. What, what's the worth? What's the value? So you would be lacking this sort of affirmative energy if you regularly engage in acts of self-sabotage, okay? Like if you are connected to your value and your, your own self-affirmation, you wouldn't be treating yourself terribly. It's like, you know, what an extreme example I'll use is like, I'm trying to explain this to a client is like, hey, how hard would I have to push you to get you to poison your mom? Like, assuming they have a good relationship with their mom. Um, usually, like, you'd have to kill me. I would never do that. It's like, well, why are you poisoning yourself with this porn stuff? <laughs> and it's like, well, because you're not connected to your own self-worth in a lot of instances. I mean, yeah, there's also self-deception going on there, too. But a lot of it's that you're not, you don't have a strong connection to your own worth, to your own love, to your own dignity. And you need that. Other signs that you're lacking affirmation energy is that uh, you regularly you lose motivation in the pursuit of your goals, thinking, you know, what's the point? It's not worth it. Um, if you regularly disrespect yourself, engage in really negative self-talk toward yourself, that's, you know, not good. That's you denying or going in the opposition to your affirmation. Uh, also, you know, the super common core feeling that everyone struggles with is, oh, I'm not good enough, right? If you're dealing with a lot of that feeling of I'm not good enough, that too is a sign of lacking affirmation. And I've talked previously about how crippling this can be because porn is kind of like this big status substitute. It lets you feel like you're this worthy dude, this you know alpha stud banging these chicks. It can make you feel like you're getting this kind of connection. And people use it because they don't feel good enough. They, they use it because deep down they're looking for some kind of connection, looking for some kind of worth, and they don't have it, so they need to resort to artificial means. And... Yeah, it's good to get this stuff as much as you can from other people, but you're never going to get it perfectly from other people. The only thing that you can fully rely on is your own capacity to love yourself. Or if you're religious, I guess you could say, you know, God, but I mean, practically speaking, it's still you. It's still up to you to allow yourself to feel God's love or whatever. So let's connect with this affirmative energy in our own body. This is what we got to do, right? And one way that people can do it is think about someone you really love unconditionally and let yourself feel that love. Where do you feel it? How does it feel? For most people, it's kind of right in the center of their chest and it's sort of this warm vibration. That's what you're looking for is this kind of warm vibration, sort of this like lifting feeling, kind of like, you know, a little spark has come on. And so a lot of people can feel it toward a loved one. Um, but, and, and another way we could, we could tap into it if you're having trouble doing it that way, is that uh, this is a Buddhist technique. They call it uh, the inner smile. And so you think about smiling, you know, like <laughs> smiling with your face, but then taking that energy and, and smiling with your heart. You know, you can even actually smile as you do it. Sort of like how we tensed our body to connect with the no. Well, we're smiling now to connect with our yes. And um, 
when you can feel that in your heart and you can smile in your heart kind of outward and radiate it, then you, 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 you're getting the energy. Now, what we're trying to do is not just point it at someone else or radiate it to the world. Well, you know, we can do that. But before we do any of that, we got to learn how to give it to ourselves. So this would be the static uh, affirmation technique is if you can give yourself that inner smile, you can connect with that inner smile and then direct it right back into the very center, deepest part of your own heart. Can you direct that love and that affirmation unconditionally to the center of your whole being? Because when you can do that and you can feel that, that is the most amazing thing that you can literally carry with yourself and give yourself all the time. Now, a lot of people really struggle with this uh, (laughs) because they've got a whole bunch of limiting beliefs. Um, I remember the first time I taught this, uh, one of the people in the workshop was saying like, oh my God, I've never felt that before. Um, brought a tear to my eye. And then I thought I heard my dad's voice saying, stop being a pussy. <laughs> so like a lot of people have very, uh, a lot of conflicts around whether they can give themselves this love. Many people have actually gotten addicted, uh, or maybe not addicted, but reliant upon denying this kind of love to themselves because this is what they use to motivate themselves. They say, oh, you suck. And since you suck, that's, you got to do this to get better. And so it's like, you know, you have to look at some of my previous videos where I talk about status and affirmation and that kind of stuff, uh, because I break it down in there as to why people do this. And, you know, it's because they're, they're hooked on conditional status rather than their unconditional worth and dignity. So if you're feeling resistance, giving yourself this love, you got to recognize that we're talking about unconditional love here, meaning like you don't need to earn it. You're entirely entitled to it. All you have to do is choose to give it to yourself. Now, if you find this resistance, it's kind of like this plaque that's built up over your heart. This is where you actually need to use some of that negation energy. You need to use that negation directed at that block, slice it down, kick it out. You know, like you got to might have to flex a little bit. You got to crack through all that plaque and burn it up. All right. And you're going to do that by disagreeing with it. And, you know, maybe it's a when you start trying to do that, you feel a, you know, a judgmental parent's voice come up saying, oh, yeah, well, you suck because it is this, this, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, you might have to just, you know, burn that off because it's just garbage that's blocking you. But as you practice this and you do this and you work through whatever the, the blocks are that are keeping you from giving yourself this love, eventually you're going to be able to walk around with this little light lit inside of your chest. And it's amazing because when you're connected to this affirmation, it's so much easier to do good stuff for yourself. And also, all of your negation sort of activities become much stronger. It's kind of like, say you set an intention, you know, I'm going to stay clean today. In order to do that, I'm going to construct my, you know, static wall of negation energy around myself against any thoughts that would tell me that, you know, using porn is okay. And you, you set that up. And then inside this fortified space, you turn on that heart light. Whew, that's going to strengthen those walls and allow them to push much, much stronger because you're going to know that anything that goes against, you know, that is trying to deny your worth. It's saying, hey, you're not worth this effort. And if you're connected with that part, it's like, yes, I am. <laughs> and so being connected to that heart light is going to allow you to maintain good states, good habits, much much longer. Like a lot of people who they, they, they'll get a good streak going, but then they fall off the wagon. I think very often it's because they disconnect from that sense of self-worth that maybe they had when they started the journey. So that's like the, the, the static affirmation, this little heart light, that's great for maintenance, like we said, but we need to know how to flex. Okay. We need to know how to take it up into the dynamic affirmation. And this is when you start tapping into that sort of righteous power, all right? And maybe you felt this heat before when you you stood up for yourself or you stood up for someone else. Um, I think actually some people are addicted to this energy in a bad way. Like you, you think about like the white knights or, you know, some of the social justice warrior types. But even like anyone who just gets off on, you know, spouting off their righteous cause, um, and that power that they feel when they're doing that, 
that's actually kind of this energy. But what we want it to be is actually connected to you and your worth and your dignity. And you don't want to be using it to beat other people up because I think, you know, in that point, there's something that's really mixed up there. But at a certain point, you got to know when you have to really flex your self-love. And this is actually most pertinent in moments of sacrifice and pain. So when it comes down to maybe you're heavily triggered and, you know, you're in a lot of discomfort and you're aching and you're craving and whatever, you're not just going to have to turn that heart light on. You're going to have to, like, you know, turn into a, a freaking blaze, you know, this huge light, okay? And you're going to have to flare it up. You're going to have to burn some extra fuel because you're going to have to suffer for your own benefit. And this is passion energy, passion. And passion's unique. People think passion's this big pleasurable thing. It's not. Passion is about pain. Passion is saying, I love something so much that I'm willing to suffer for it. That's why we call it the passion of the Christ. It's like, why would, you know, this dude who gets tortured to death, is that passion? That's not how the modern person tends to think about passion, but that's really what it's about. It's about saying, you know, you care about something so much that you are willing to suffer for it. And you have to be willing to suffer for yourself. If you aren't, and you're not connected to that fire, to, of your own worth, your own value to be to, to be suffered for, you're not, just not going to do it. It's not going to matter. It's not going to matter what kind of self-talk you have, what kind of habits you have lined up, unless you are tangibly, viscerally connected with this sensation, you're just not going to do it. So that's what this is all about. It's about connecting with the parts of yourself that are actually going to support the good thoughts and the good actions. And I, I would say probably the easiest way to connect to this kind of force is to first connect to the passive, you know, that, that warm sort of self-love and her smile sort of thing. But then instead of just looking inward, it's looking outward at something. It's a radiant force. It's kind of like, imagine that, <laughs> all right, here, here's, here's the story, all right? You, an invading army comes in, say it's some kind of tri trigger. They come in and they try to take over your control center. You flex your no, you throw them back. And then you close the city gates against them. So that's your two different kinds of no's. Then you kindle your little fire of self-love. You feel it, you, that inner smile. But then you realize they're still at the gates and they're like they're, it's pressing up against you and trying to hurt you, trying to get back in or whatever. That's when you got to flex. And imagine this little fire comes into this big fire whirlwind and you focus it right through the gates right out there at those people. And that's really what this is about. It's about taking that self-love inside and reflecting it outward. So for example, you decide you, you gotta go to the gym. Well, here's how you can flex that energy. You say, all right, I'm good. And you connect to that goodness. And then you say, all right, no, I'm gonna honor that goodness by treating myself well by going to the gym. I'm gonna take care of my body because I'm worth it. And it's that sort of radiant sort of force where it goes out of this energetic layer into the rational layer, into the practical layer where you actually do stuff then. That's it. That's what we're trying to go for. But in order to do that, you need to know how to fight off the, the negative thoughts and all the kind of stuff that would stifle and hold down that flame, that passion that you have. So I think this is probably enough. I don't think I, I want to give you guys any more right now, but hopefully this was something you could follow. If not, tell me what parts you got lost on, what parts didn't click, because I'm always trying to improve the way that I talk about this. And it's sort of hard to talk about, you know, putting words to internal sensations, but hopefully you're able to connect with some of this stuff and it gives you an idea of what you need to be able to do if you want to be able to show up as the person that you want, you need to be able to feel these things and move these things. It's like, it's almost like most people don't realize that they have like a bunch of buttons and levers that they can press inside of themselves that will make them more powerful. It's like, it's a shame that the human uh, body and spirit doesn't come with an operating manual to, <laughs> to tell us all this stuff. So it's up to us to try and figure it out. So thank you so much for listening. Look forward to hearing your feedback. Stay tuned for some new announcements about the upcoming course and uh, stay sharp. I'll see you in the next one. 
Hey, if you found this episode useful and you want to hear more, make sure you like, subscribe, and if you're tuning in on YouTube, make sure you hit that bell button to turn on notifications. But if you really like this content and you would like to join the tribe of Universal Men, then you need to head on over to the Universal Man Patreon page by clicking the link in the description. We call ourselves the Vanguard because we are committed to living on the front lines of life. By joining, you'll gain access to exclusive content, weekly accountability, community chat rooms, and live calls. Also, by joining the Vanguard, you become a part of my inner circle. Therefore, you get my prioritized attention. Most importantly, though, you'll be joining a crew of like-minded guys that can help support and inspire you on your journey of masculine self-mastery. So click the link below and sign up today.